Isaiah chapter 22 will be in verse 1 and 2. Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 22, verse 1 and 2. The title of the message is, What Aileth Thee Now? What Aileth Thee Now? Isaiah 22, verse 1 and 2. The burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetop? <clears throat> thou that art full of stairs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. The prophet here is telling us some things. In verse 1 and 2, he sees the inhabitants crowded together on their rooftops in a state of uh, animated merriment. They're excited. In verse 5 to 7, outside the walls, there's an army gathering. It's about to take over the town. In verse 8 to 11, preparations have been made for resistance which are described there, but there has been no turning to God. It's just been outward preparations, no heart preparations. The danger has made the bulk of the people become reckless. In verse 12 to 13, instead of humbling themselves and putting on sackcloth and crying to God for mercy, they determined to drown their care in drink and sensual enjoyment. Isaiah attempts to rouse their sanity by asking them this thought-provoking question. What aileth thee now? What? The word what? He doesn't say who aileth thee. He says what? It's a thing. It's objects. This is the illusion of security. They've put up some bricks. They've added some stones to the wall. They think that's going to save them. What's your illusion of security? The illusion of security was the problem when, Zebulun, or when Zeba and Zalmunna were taken by Gideon. You remember that story? That's in Judges chapter 8, verse 11. I'll just read it to you. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in the tents east of Nobah and Jogbaha and smote the, co uh, smote the host, for the host was secure. That is, they were out there and it was nap time. They were sleeping. The army was asleep. But they thought they were secure. And that's when Gideon got them. And that's where they capture Zeba and Zalmunna. The illusion of security was the problem when the Danites sent five men to steal a city from their brothers. That happens in Judges, just a few chapters over, in Judges chapter 18. It says, The five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. And there was no magistrate in the land that they might put them to shame in anything. Shame is a good thing. That's why we have the law. That's why we have magistrates. That's why we have police. If you do wrong, they shame you. <laughs> they should shame you. Now, God intends shame for sin. Sin should be shameful. Uh, the illusion of security was a problem when God announced judgment on Israel for their iniquities. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 7, it says, As they were increased, the nation, so they sinned against me. God's taken it personal. He said, I allowed them to multiply. I blessed them. As they increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. The result of sin is shame. In Zephaniah 2.15, he talks about Jerusalem again. He says, this is, the, uh, re, uh, this is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. You got to be careful when you start claiming to be God. That's how he shows up. That's the first thing he claims. I am that I am. Now, this city wants to claim to be God. I am and none else. The illusion of security was the problem when God drowned the earth in Noah's flood. And it will be the problem when he returns at Armageddon. In Luke chapter 17, verse 26, we get Jesus Christ's own words on it. Luke 17, 26 to 27. 
Luke 17, verse 26 to 27. He says, As in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So here's what happened during Noah's day, and it's what's going to happen again and is happening. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. They thought they were secure. They heard Noah saying, you better prepare, you better run, you better repent. But they thought they were secure just where they were, but they weren't. Our verse in Isaiah 22, verse 1, he says, What aileth thee now? We saw what. What was the illusion of security? The next word in our question is aileth. What aileth thee now? Aileth is the illusion of happiness. These phony physicians have self-prescribed themselves merriment as the cure for what ails them. They're up on the rooftop having a party. Because it's better to party than to remember what might happen or to take note of the drastic situation they're in. The illusion of happiness was a problem when Zeb uh, Zebulun, Naphtali, and Galilee were depopulated depopulated by Tiglath Pileser. Say that fast ten times. <laughs> that story you'll find in 2 Kings 15, but I'm going to get the account out of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3. Here's Isaiah telling us about that, that uh, time in history. From God's point of view. Isaiah 9, verse 3. It says, Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. That's selfish. I'm getting something out of it. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. Ah, it's Christmas time. I'm getting some goodies. That's a short lived joy. It's not joy from God. In Isaiah 22, verse 2, he said, Thou art full of stirs. What stirs? That's excitement, something that stirs you up. Thou art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. But the joy wasn't from God. It was joy they manufactured. It was an illusion of joy. Joy is an illusion when it's rooted in self-security, when it's the result of reckless behavior, or anything that's not given direct from God. God is the source of joy. Without it, we can manufacture it, but it's not real. It's fake, and we know it, or before long we will. The illusion of happiness was the problem when the young man in Proverbs seeks friendship with an ungodly company. In Proverbs 23, verse 6, Man always seeks to make himself happy. There's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way, according to God. He makes the rules, so we say, yes, sir. <laughs> Proverbs 23, verse 6. Here's the advice. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up and lose thy sweet words. Happiness has to come from God, the only source of joy, or else it backfires on you, according to the Bible. Our question was, what aileth thee now? We know what what is, what was the illusion of security. Aileth, the illusion of happiness. He says, what aileth thee? What's the the in, the in that verse mean? The is the illusion of self-reliance. They figured, hey, I can take care of myself better than anybody else. I know me better than anybody else. And that's what we naturally think because we spend all day with ourselves. <laughs> However, God knows ourselves because he made ourselves. 
He knows ourselves better. Illusion of self-reliance was the problem when Judah was threatened by the Assyrians. In Isaiah 22, look at verse 12. Isaiah 22, look at verse 12. He says, And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping, and to mourning, and to baldness, and to girding with sackcloth. Imagine that. God's calling to man, saying, I've got something for you to do. I want you to weep, I want you to mourn, and I want you to put some sackcloth on. Because you're going to need my help. And this is how I give my help. It's to people that are humble. He called them to do that. What do they do? Verse 13. It has to be in verse 13. <laughs> and behold, joy and gladness, slaying, uh, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Self-reliant. I don't need God to tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. That's what they thought. The illusion of self-reliance is the problem when a rich man decides to retire. We see Jesus tell us about this in Luke 12, verse 19. Now, according to man's standards, this guy has done just what he's supposed to. He's worked hard, and he should. He's saved him some money, and he should. And now it's time to take a rest. The problem is he's the one doing the deciding. Never does he ask God, can I take a rest now? Is it time to retire? Luke 12, verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Just like they were doing when the Assyrians were about to capture them. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Self-reliance does no good when the self is gone. <laughs> self-reliance is the illusion that man craves. Man craves control. If I can be in control, I feel like, you know, I've got what it takes to make me happy. I've got what it takes to control circumstances. We can't be self-reliant. We've got to rely on God. The illusion of self-reliance is the problem when a young uh, man decides he'll control his own destiny. In Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. This is just natural. That's why the Bible tells us to watch out for it. You start thinking, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to become this, and I want to become that. And so you start plotting and planning. This is how I'm going to do it. But you, you had better watch out. God's taking note of your thoughts. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. Now, if it stopped right there, we'd be happy. But it doesn't. But know thou... That for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. You better be careful how you plot and plan. God will judge it. It'd be better to ask him to do the plotting and the planning for you and you just get on board. Self-reliance is dangerous. The illusion of self-reliance is the problem when a young woman sets out to just enjoy life. That seems normal, to just enjoy this life you're in. A Christian has a higher call than just enjoying. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 6. 1 God's purpose is not to spend all day trying to figure out how to make you happy. It should be our goal to try to figure out how to make him happy. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 6 says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. 
If that's your end goal in life, just to have fun and have pleasure, you'll quickly find it's an illusion that's always just out of reach. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives, <laughs> while she liveth. It's deadly. The illusion of self-reliance <clears throat> is the problem when the carnal Christian tries to hold hands with the world. You can't be friends with the world. You can convert the world. You can mourn for the world. You can try to help them, but you can't be their buddy. Look at it in 2 Timothy 3, verse 4. He's going to tell you what happens in the last days. As the apostasy grows, here's what happens. <clears throat> Traitors, heady, high-minded, that's all selfish. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. <clears throat> now, he didn't say they don't love God. They just love pleasure more. Take note in your own life. When you start, when you got time, when God brings it to your mind, start thinking, okay, what would I rather do? <laughs> Read his word or go do whatever, whatever is pleasurable to you. Well, okay, the flesh is going to say 100%, let's go get some pleasure. Whatever you consider pleasure. But you got to keep it in check. You might find yourself in that verse, love and pleasure more than God. The illusion of self-reliance will be the problem when Babylon stands before God at the judgment. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 7. Revelation 18, verse 7. Revelation 18, 7 says, How much she glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she uh, saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. She sure worked her way to becoming happy on her own, self-reliant. She said, I've determined I'm not going to have any sorrow. I've determined it. Well, guess what? She's not the judge. God is the judge. We don't make the rules. He does. What is the illusion of security? Aleth is the illusion of happiness. The, the illusion of self-reliance. But there's one more word in our question. He says, what aileth thee now? I like the word now in the Bible. When you read the word now in the Bible, it means now. In some form or fashion, you can apply it to the moment you're reading. He says, what aileth thee now? Now is the invitation to action. Now you can do something about it. When it's history, it's then. And it's too late. But now you can make a change. In Psalms chapter 95, I'm going to show you a verse. This is a often used verse in the Bible. Psalms 95, verse 7. Four times the scripture is going to give this warning, and it's not just a warning, it's an invitation as well. Psalms 95, verse 7 and 8. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. That's, that applies, any time you read that, it applies, because it'll be a day. <laughs> Today, this is the time you can do something about it. Today, harden not your heart. Now, this is going to be used again three times in the scripture. It'll be interesting to see the numbering system that goes with it. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. First time we saw it was in Psalms 95, 7. Now it's Hebrews 3, 7. Hebrews 3, 7, he says... 
Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, so forth, so on. Then it's going to happen again down in verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Then turn over the chapter, chapter 4, verse 7. There must be something special about this verse. We get it three times in two chapters. Hebrews 4, verse 7. Again he limited the certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That he's pleading with these people. Don't get a hard heart. God didn't allow that verse to pop up in the Bible so many times if he didn't know that was our natural inclination to get a hard heart. And when does it happen? When we hear his voice. Don't harden your heart when you hear his voice. Have a soft heart. God is the only basis for joy. It says in his presence is fullness of joy. That's where joy comes from. We can rejoice in what we possess, the things you have. A Christian can, because it's God-given. We can rejoice in what we lose, because the Lord taketh away. He does. We can rejoice in the future because the Lord provides. We don't have to worry about the future because we're not self-reliant. We're relying on Him, somebody bigger than self. We can rejoice in the darkness and perils of life because He that keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. We've got somebody bigger than self at the wheel. In conclusion, I ask you the question, what aileth thee now? For the Christian, in submission to God, the answer should be nothing. That's right, nothing. If you can supply any other answer to the question, that's what controls you. If there's any answer that comes to mind when you hear that question, that's what you've got to get rid of. And God will test you on it. In Psalm 7, verse 9, God asked man this question through circumstances on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. <laughs> In Psalm 7, verse 9, I'm just going to pick up the end of it there. It says, The righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. What's the reins? The reins on a horse are what guides it, what directs it. So God's going to try them. He's going to say, If I pull this way, will you actually turn? He's going to try those reins. That trying reveals the answer to our question. What aileth thee now? In Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 2. Jeremiah 12, verse 2. Most Christians will fall into this verse right here. Jeremiah 12, verse 2. Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root. They grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. According to the outside, everything looks good. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. They've got all the right answers. They've got plenty of proof that they're the scholar. However, when it comes to God controlling them, no, sir, you're not touching my reins. What aileth thee? God's going to tug on the rein. Look at Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. There's no excuse. God's told us he's going to do this ahead of time. It always comes as a surprise to us, though. For some reason, we think, Hey, this didn't work out the way I wanted it to. You know, God get down here and fix this. No, he's, he's trying the reins. That's what he said he's going to do. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the hearts. I try the reins. Now it gets scary. Even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. It's a scary proposition. 
when you start realizing, hey, I'm pulling against God. He's the one tugging the rein. Now, how do you know when he's pulling at the reins? When life doesn't go the way you planned it. When your propositions for what's best didn't turn out the way you intended, that's God testing the rain. Ask yourself, what aileth thee now? Isaiah chapter 9, verse, three, uh, verse 13. Isaiah 9, verse 13. Isaiah 9, verse 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore, okay, if you get hard-hearted and you won't turn to God, he's already declared what's going to happen. Therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel, uh, from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. The ancient and honorable, he's the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he's the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for everyone is an hypocrite. That's right. They know all the answers. Their mouth sounds real good when they're talking. But when God's pulling on the reins, it's a different story. They're a hypocrite, an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. God has a hand stretched out. There's an invitation open. He's saying, don't harden your heart. I've got some instruction. However, that hand can just as easily... Do what he did in verse 13. Smite you. If it does, turn to him while the hand is there. Because soon that hand will be replaced with a rod. The Assyrians are called his rod. And they come in and they teach Judah a lesson that they soon forget. <laughs> Let's not follow their example. What aileth thee now? Hopefully nothing. Nothing. But ask yourself, that'll change from day to day. You'll have to ask yourself, remind yourself, hey, self, what's ailing you? God's in control of this. Come ye sinners lost and lonely, Jesus' blood can make you free, for he said,